With thoughts on CM Punk possibly returning to WWE and more, this is Wrestling Rambles. My name is John and you're watching the Wrestling Report. Before we move on, make sure you subscribe to Wrestling Rambles with notifications on and don't forget to like the video. Recalling his return to WWE TV and not being a part of WrestleMania 39, Bobby Lashley said on After the Bell, Our business is very troubling at times and it's very stressful mentally because you want to know where you're at and if you're talking about the last break I took, the situation involving WrestleMania kind of really, really hit me pretty hard. I'd put in a lot of work throughout the year, I put myself on a certain level within the company and I've kept that level up. I work my ass off and I train hard all the time time and everybody knows that's just me and when that big show came around i just didn't have a spot at wrestlemania you try and hold it in and when you have your kids calling when you're supposed to be there and i'm there in los angeles ready to go the whole time you're thinking call me in coach call me in coach call me in call me in i'm ready my kids after the first date called me dad are you going to be on it because if you're on we'll fly up and see you and everything like that because they've been to everything that i was in so that's that was a little bit of a mind trip taking a back seat at a time like that. Taking to X, former WWE and WCW writer Vince Russo called out AEW president Tony Khan as he wrote, I'll never forget when Tony Khan started AEW, he took a shot at me, not even knowing me or ever having a conversation with me, in an effort to get over with the cool kids by saying when Vince Russo went to WCW, they had a hangnail. Russo proceeded to cut the whole arm off. Yeah, TK said that regardless of the fact that in my first three months at WCW, the numbers went up, which I have backed up with data right here. From there, TK admitted over and over and over again that Dave Meltzer was a huge influence on both himself and the talent. So, for four years now, TK has been booking for Dave, the wrestling journalist, and the smart mark crowd. And where has that gotten AEW? Where? Outside of that blip in Wembley, that came and went. The AEW audience has not grown one iota. Maybe it's time for something new, Tony. As a matter of fact, today would be a great day to look back 25 years at the WWE Survivor Series and watch and learn how a successful storyline is done. You're being stubborn, man, and not listening to those who know because you want to get over with the black shirt crowd has gotten you nowhere. Nowhere. Revealing the success AEW had with their recent Like a Dragon Gaiden Street Fight match on Dynamite, it was noted that, as Fightful Select had reported, AEW landed a big deal with Sega for the first Street Fight match that aired on the November 15th AEW Dynamite. We've learned much more about the deal and how it came to be. The Sega deal was into the six figures and largely connected to Kenny Omega. The sponsorship was tied to the Yakuza spinoff Like a Dragon Gaiden, the man who erased his name and featured several references to the game. Asked about defending the Intercontinental Championship in the main event of Night 1 for WrestleMania 40, Gunter said to WrestlingNews.co, That's not going to happen, but I think there's a ranking system and everything for a reason. I think it's quite obvious that I outgrew the Intercontinental Championship already. I am ready to make that next step. Explaining why he never ended up joining WWE, former TNA star Hernandez told Steve Fall of 10 Count, In the early part of my career, like 2001 or 2002, I did dark matches with WWE. I'll be honest, I didn't want to be in WWE at the time. I liked All Japan Pro Wrestling and Mexico. He just ripped me for about three or four minutes. I waited for him to stop. I go, sir, thank you very much, but please never call my house again and hung up on him. Because yes, I sent tapes. Yes, I wanted to get a job, but I'm not going to just let you disrespect me.
Talking about his journey in WWE, former star for the company, Tyler Breeze told the Insight Podcast, When I got hired, it was 2010, so a way different time. Pre-NXT, this was FCW. FCW was kind of like, you're a part of WWE, but WWE is here and FCW is right over there. Around the corner and you don't really see it. Even looking at the hiring cycles made me think I'd be cut. When I came in, it was right at the end of when they wanted everybody to be really big and really jacked. Me, obviously, had never been a gigantic guy so I got hired and I came in and I thought oh my god there's no way I'm going to last here these guys are huge how am I supposed to compete with this you're hired for a reason and all of a sudden you see those people and they're going they drop off here or they go up and they do whatever they're doing and now all of a sudden they started to hire guys who knew how to wrestle and they wanted to wrestle and that is when all of a sudden you see the Cesaros come in Brian Danielson come in the Moxleys the Seths all those guys kind of got away from that look and more into the work kind of hiring cycle that lasts for a while and then they go man we should probably get some big guys in here and all of a sudden they're back in i saw that cycle go a bunch of times so when that happens you have to kind of be realistic with yourself and not live in the delusion of oh i'm here i'm safe you're never safe and the second that you think you are you're out the average person's career i think he told me was five years a five-year career of actually making good money even if you make astronomical money, five years is not a long time. It goes very quickly. So even getting into it, you have to have that mindset of, what am I going to do after this? What am I going to do when the money stops? When all of a sudden your monthly income goes to zero dollars, that's terrifying. I was with WWE for 11 years, so I long made it past my five-year average. But I was ready to go way before my 11 years. I was putting little things in place and everything else was a bonus at that point. Mentioning Roman Reigns wrestling fewer matches now that he is the undisputed Universal Champion, Booker T claimed on his Hall of Fame podcast, you know, people are going to find something to complain about all the time. I think one of the biggest complaints was guys work too much. Go back to the old days and just think about how many times Hogan worked on television in a calendar year. Might be less than that, and nobody was bigger than Hogan. Can you imagine a boxer boxing 22 times in a year? Or an MMA fighter fighting 22 times in a year? 22 times is actually a lot. That's just the way I look at it. So I look at the pros and cons of it. If Roman wasn't selling no tickets, we could talk. Going over The Rock's comments on the Joe Rogan experience, where the great one claimed he thought about leaving pro wrestling for an MMA promotion, Dave Meltzer noted on Wrestling Observer Radio that The Rock was channeling Hulk Hogan. He said in 1997 he was thinking very seriously, and he was very close to signing with Pride Fighting Championships. That's what he said in 1997. He said he was making $150,000 a year as a pro wrestler, and he was hanging out in Southern California, and he found out that these fighters in Pride were making $250,000 per fight and he figured it was better than wrestling five nights a week and making not nearly the money that's what he said that's what he claimed i am i don't know i'm trying to think if the pride fighters were making that kind of money and i don't think any of them were in the 2000s yes but he said he was friends with ken shamrock which he was friends with ken shamrock they worked together in wwe i remember that it kind of floored me it was kind of like when hulk hogan used to say he was one of the original stars of pride he used to say his new japan matches were shoots and he fought in pride in japan But yeah, it's interesting that Dwayne said that. the possibility of cuts to the NWA. It was said that House of Wrestling has learned that the NWA is expected to make cuts to its roster in various production areas soon. One source we spoke with told us that Corrigan will make cuts at every corner. One example we were given on the production side is that the hair and makeup department's budget will be cut roughly in half. Touching on the possibility of CM Punk making a WWE comeback, former WCW president Eric Bischoff said on his 83 Weeks podcast, they don't really need it for Survivor Series in Chicago. It's already a sellout and they don't need him. WWE doesn't need him. Now, Royal Rumble going into WrestleMania, I could buy that as a possibility because it makes sense. They don't need Punk. There is absolutely zero need for him. However, that surge you would get, the buzz going into WrestleMania, that is a period of time that you want 
every bit of buzz that you can get, but I don't think it will happen in Chicago. Staying on this topic, general manager of SmackDown Nick Aldis said this regarding a return to WWE for CM Punk, telling BBC Norfolk, he's built and cultivated a huge fan base, he sells a ton of merchandise, he moves numbers, he sells tickets, he sells merchandise, he puts butts in seats. Call me old fashioned, but that trumps everything else. There is a way. There is a way for him to compete in the WWE, and I think if it can be done, I think there's a way it could be really good business for everybody. I will wait with bated breath like everyone else to see if it happens. If it does, I'll be excited to be involved with it. And this was your pro wrestling news update. I hope you're all having a great day. Thank you so much for watching and I will see y'all later.